for joining us on this morning. We pray that you will click the share button and start a watch party with your family and friends. Our scripture this morning will come from Nahum verse, chapter number one, verse number seven. And that's Nahum one and seven from the New Living Translation. And it reads, the Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. He is close to those who trust in him. I'm going to read it again. The Lord is good, a strong refuge when trouble comes. He is close to those who trust in him. First of all, this verse says that God is good. That means God is merciful. He is gracious. He is long-suffering. God patiently waits for us to seek him. Thank God he has not written us off because of our disobedience. The verse also says that God is a strong refuge when trouble comes. He's somebody that you can run to when you have trouble in your life. But to the people who refuse to believe in him, God's punishment blazes like an angry fire. They have no safe place to go to. But for those who love God, he provides a refuge, a place of safety, and a strong home. In times of conflict and danger, in times of sickness, we can run to God because he is strong enough to handle whatever we're going through. In the end of the verse, it says he is close to those who trust in him. If you want God to be close to you, you must trust him, believe in him, depend on him. Simply trust in the promises of God and you'll find all those promises in the Holy Bible. And you know, I've read some of those promises. That's why I know for a fact that God is a good God. He is a great God. He can do anything but fail. He has moved so many mountains out of my way. God is a wonderful God. And all of us have had mountains in our lives that God has moved out, moved us around. And we thank God for that. Help us see God is a good God. good God. He's a great God. He can do anything but fail. He has moved so many mountains out of my
Father God in heaven, send the name of Jesus the Christ, we come. Lord, we thank you for another privilege, another honor. God, we honor you today for you are the great God. Lord, you are good. You've been good to us and you've shown us how good you are over and over and over again. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for blessing our lives and keeping us focused and keeping us in your will, for putting a hedge of protection around us, even in the midst of danger seen and unseen. Lord, we honor you today, Father God, and we come today to praise your name, to worship you, to give you glory, to bless you, Father God. Lord, we come today, Father God, for everything that we have, you have provided. We come today, Father God, that everything we will have, you will give. And we thank you for it. Lord, we know that all good and all perfect gifts come from you, Father God, comes from the God who is above. And Lord, we thank you now. We bless your name now. Lord, we ask you to speak, speak to us through your word this morning. Bless your word to fall on good soil, that life will roll on, that we will be blessed of you. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray, and we ask it all. Amen, and thank God. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. We have come together one more again to give him honor, to give him glory, and to give him praise. I'm going to call your attention again to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're looking at verses 6 through 10 on today. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 6 through 10. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 6 through 10. We find Moses still in his dialogue with the, the church that has come out of Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 6 through 10. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 6 to, through 10. These are God's promises, God's blessings, and, and God's need to be worshipped. Amen. He, is, he needs us to worship him on, on our behalf, not on his behalf. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 6 through 10. When you found it, you will discover these words. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, a, a fountains of spring of springs that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, scarcity, in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron, and out of his hills you will dig carpet. Copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. I'll read verse 10 again. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord, your God, for the good land which he has given you. I want to simply talk about bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. We find ourselves today in the midst of all type of situations many of which we rather not find ourselves. We find ourselves in the midst of an economy that regardless of from day to day what the stock market say, for many, unemployment is at their house. We find ourselves today in, a, in the midst of situations where we are going about our day from day to day and struggling is really all around us. As we move in this modern day society, we find ourselves at odds with each other. Whether we're at odds because of our race being different, 
or whether we are at odds because we are trying to get enough and we're trying to get in front of somebody who's about to get what we want. We find ourselves at odds with each other because we understand that the vaccine is present and we don't really want to wait our turn. We find ourselves at odds with each other because we've come to the conclusion that we don't have enough food in the United States of America. Once we had food on our table and we had nothing to worry about, there used to be a time where where we had all we wanted. We drove what we wanted to drive. We lived where we wanted to live. But somebody listening to me this morning have fallen on hard times. I want to suggest, suggest to you today, bless the Lord. We find ourselves in the middle of bereavement because life has taken a deadly turn for our family members, for our friends, and even for our enemies. We find ourselves in the midst of discrimination, and discrimination is at an all-time high, way worse than the 1950s and 60s. But in the midst of, the, of it all, we need to make sure we find the audacity. We look for the ability. We search for God. So much so until we can bless the Lord. Yes. Somebody is saying to me today, preacher, what's the reason? What is the cause that you're confronting us with this thought that we ought to bless the Lord? I'm so glad you asked because the Bible is clear that even when there's no stocks, present, even when there are no, no herds to be seen, even, even when there's no money to be cleared, the Lord is worthy to be blessed. Yes. He is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our honor. He is worthy of all the glory we can give to him. So we have to come to a point in our lives where we realize that God is worthy to be blessed. Somebody, somebody listening to me that today may have been wanting to end it all. Somebody may have given up on their lives. Let me just share with you today. Just hold on just a little while longer. Yes. The end of this trauma is coming. Hold on, hold on just a little while longer, longer because sooner or later, God is going to put it all to rest. When we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 5 on last week, we found the children of Israel wandering through the wilderness. And as they wandered through the wilderness, Moses said to them, whatever you do, remember the Lord your God. Yes. Moses, Moses said to them, what we need to do is every commandment that is given unto you, from the Lord your God, be careful to observe them. Moses said, Moses said to, to the children of Israel during that time, and I say to you, even in the 21st century, you need to make sure that you observe and make sure you pay attention to the commandments of God. God's commandments are clear. God's commandments are or, or, or something that we ought to be focused on, Moses said to them, be observative of the commandments. He says, live and multiply. Moses said to them that you must remember the Lord, your God, who have brought you through the wilderness for some 40 years. He reminded them, even though you were in the wilderness for 40 years, even though you were there, God took care of you. He said, you have to be humbled. And, and God humbled them because they had no food and God had to provide it for them. He said it was only a test. He said this was only a test. God humbled you and allowed you to be hungry. And he, when he allowed you to be hungry, he fed you. 
Let me just say to you today, today, I want to say to you that you need to make sure that you understand that there is no God like our God. Yes, there is no God like the God we serve. There is no God who is able to allow us to be hungry and feed us. Right. Let me just share with you today. It's a sign. It's a sign of who you serve when you find yourself in a bad situation. And even in the bad situation that you got yourself in, your God is looking out for you. I want to tell you today, the Israelites found themselves in a bad situation. They were in the wilderness. They got hungry because they did not remember the commandments of God. And in the midst of their hunger, God humbled them. And when he humbled them, he fed them with manna from above. He gave them food. He gave them manna. He gave them this bread that their forefathers had never seen and they had never seen. I want today to honor and lift up the God who will feed us when we're hungry. He got a good track record. He has a good track record in the fact that he is able to feed us when we're hungry. My question to you this morning, will your God feed you when you're hungry? My God will feed you when you're hungry. He goes on in verses 1 through 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says to them, as they marched in the wilderness, they had clothing. They had garments, and their garments did not wear out. Look at God. God allowed them to keep their suits, their clothing, to keep their garments, their dresses for 40 years, and they didn't wear out. Let me tell you, there is no God like our God. This God that we serve is able to keep your threads together. The God that we serve is able to keep your garments in place. The God that we serve is able to make sure that your clothing does not wear out. He goes on to say, he says, he says to us this morning that in when the children of Israel was wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, their feet did not swell. He says, he says their feet did not swell. He says their shoes did not wear out. He says their garments did not wear out. He took care of them. God became the podiatrist in the midst of the wilderness. Yeah, he, he was a foot doctor. He, he made sure that their feet did not swell in the wilderness. And Moses closes out verse number five in Deuteronomy chapter eight and said, you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Mm -hmm. You see that the son, the son is chastened by a loving father. The, the son is, is disciplined by a loving father. The son is, is always set down by a loving father. Growing up, growing up, daddy often had a phrase, and, and his phrase was, as you're going out, remember, you are a Davis. <laughs> you're not a Carrier. You, you're not a Weeks. You, you, you're not an Anderson. You're not a, you're not a, a, a Perry. You are a Davis. Yes. And as you leave this house, you remember you are a Davis. And when we came back, if we didn't represent the Davis name well, he disciplines us. He disciplined us. He, he put us down. He, he set us down. He took car keys. He made us not go out to, again for a long period of time. As a matter of fact, he whipped us. I know children these days, some children don't even know what the word whip represents. Some children don't even know what, what a, a, a whipping is because we have gotten to the point where we put our children in time out. Some children don't even know what the, the raising of the voice is. Some children don't even know what the lowering of the voice is. But daddy had a reason for disciplining us. He had a reason for whipping us. He had a reason for putting things aside because he loved us. Right. Let me just say to you today that Moses says to the children of Israel that the chastening of the father was because he loved them. God had chastened them. God has, has set them down. God has taken the keys from them. God has allowed them to move from one point to the other. Their shoes didn't, look at what God does. Their shoes didn't wear out. The garments didn't wear out. Their feet didn't swell. They walking through the wilderness for 40 years with no swollen feet. It's because God loved them. 
God kept them. God blessed them and he blessed them in spite of them. You see, God has a way of blessing us without breaking us. He has a way of disciplining us without killing us. Right. And what the God that we serve does, he makes sure that we understand at the end of the day, I'm doing this because I love you. Mm -hmm. I never understood. I never understood. You know, I'd rather for daddy to whip because daddy whips and he sits down somewhere and he go on and watch the game and do something else. But when mama whips, she, she will remind you from morning to evening the reason why she whipped you. And not only that, sometimes she got the wrong end of the belt and, and the belt got twisted up. So the leather part got caught in her hand and the other part landed on you. It's because she had the statement and she said in her statement is that I, this going to hurt me more than hurt you. I'm trying to figure it out today. How does it hurt her more than it hurt me? It's because of her love for us. It leads us right here to to verse number six, Deuteronomy chapter eight. Bless the Lord. It says, therefore, because God loves you, because God chastens you, because God has blessed you, that your shoes didn't wear out, that your clothes didn't wear out, that your feet didn't swell, therefore, you ought to have the right attitude about God. And let me tell you this morning, if God woke you up this morning, you ought to have the right attitude about yes. God. You, you, you can't down God. You can't put God down. You should not be upset with God because you just didn't get things your way. You have to come to the conclusion in your life that God is good and he is good all the time. In the midst of him showing me love, in the midst of him disciplining me, God is yet good. He says, therefore, you shall keep the commandments, and you ought to want to keep the commandments of your God because he's been good. He woke you up. He, he laid you down. He, he, he got you up this morning. The same God that has blessed us all yesterday evening is saying the, God, the same God who's blessing us right now. Therefore, you should keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his way and to fear him. We ought to keep God's commandment. This word walks means our lifestyle. This word walks means our conversation. This word walks mean how we carry ourselves. We ought to walk in God's commandments. In other words, we ought to walk circumspectly to God. We ought to walk with God. We ought to walk with him. We ought to live for him. We ought to be examples of him. Paul picks this thought up in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where he says that we ought not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When he talks about being being conformed, he, when he talks about being conformed, you see in this tube, there is lotion in this tube. And in this tube, this lotion has conformed to the shape of this tube. And regardless of how long it's in this tube, it's going to always take on the form of this tube. But when I shake it and I push it out, it no longer takes on the form of this tube. Now it takes on the form of whatever is placed on, whatever is put upon, or whatever is put in. God doesn't want us to conform to this world because this world is a corrupt world. The world that we live in is a messed up world. We are not to become as this lotion or any other solid or liquid or any other melted source and conform to what we're putting in. We're in this world, but we ought to live like we got another world going on. We're in this world, but we ought to look forward to the future that we have in Jesus. Jesus Christ. He says in our walking, in our talking, in our conversation, we ought to not take on the things of this world. He says, he says, whatever you do, you ought to keep the commandment in your walking. And in your walking, you ought to walk in God's way. Yes. You ought to walk in God's way and you ought to walk in God's way in the fear of God. 
This word fear is twofold here. This word fear, first of all, you know it is a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. It's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Now, we ought not be surprised about the, the conditions of our nation. We ought not be surprised about the situations that have taken place this past week. It ought not be surprising to us to know that mean men, have bombarded the capital of the United States and put at jeopardy the lives of those who have been voted into office. And neither should it be surprised that after the bombarding of the capital took place, some of those same mean men were just as mean as before the incident took place. We ought not be surprised because when men do not fear God, when men do not have a fear of God, when men do not understand that it's a bad thing to fall into the hands of an angry God, they will do anything. Yes. And they will act in a kind of way. Oh, it's an uproar now. It's an uproar now where in the summertime when the police officers were bombarding protesters, then they didn't, there was not an uproar. But let me just share with you now, because men do not respect God, the second thing of this fear is a respect, a wholesome respect for God. And because men do not have a wholesome, a decent respect for God, they will do anything and they will say anything. They will take pictures doing wrong. They will put themselves on video to do wrong. They will act any kind of way because they have come to the conclusion that God can't do nothing about it and neither can the United States government do anything about it. All right. And let me just share with you, men who, who bombarded the Capitol, they, they weren't men who were unlearned. They were not people that were, were uneducated. These were men who are CEOs of companies. <clears throat> These are men and women who are, who are military uh, retirees. These are men and women who have accomplished great things in this world. But when the devil blinds your eyes and you're caught up in a coat by one man, you will do anything, you will say anything, and you will act any kind of way. We ought not be surprised. We ought not be surprised that our nation have double standards for protesters. We ought not be surprised that, that they will prepare for peaceful protesters, but they will let alone and do not touch those who are violent protesters. The third thing about that incident, when it comes to a lack of respect for God, the third thing about that incident, the only reason they are concerned now is because their lives were put at jeopardy. The, the, the only reason they're concerned now, as long as they were sitting in their sealed houses, as long as nobody was messing with their thing, they were all right with it. But because their lives were in jeopardy, now uh, this is the worst thing that ever happened in society. Let me tell you, during the summertime, June, July, and August, when men and women, little boys and little girls, was getting killed, and they were letting guys walk down in the middle of the street with a machine gun and offer him water and do nothing about it, it was a bad thing then. But because they have no fear of God, and because their lives were jeopardized, it's a big deal now. It's a big deal now. And because they saw their life flash before them, oh, we got to do something about this. And over the last 50 years, they have been doing nothing about it. It's only because they have no fear. No fear. Meaning, first of all, they have no uh, idea that anybody, even God, would do anything about it. When you think somebody will do something about it, you sneak and do things. You run and do things. You hide and do things. But these guys and these girls were doing it in front of the camera, in front of international television, in front of the World Wide Web. 
And they had come to the conclusion that no one would do anything about it. The second reason they did it, as I said to you, they didn't have no respect for God. What Moses is saying in the text, regardless of what you go through, regardless of what's going on around you, you ought to have a wholesome respect for Almighty God. Yes, right. You got to respect him. You got to respect him. Even if one of your family members perish, you got to respect God. Mm -hmm. Even if you didn't get what you wanted to get, you got to respect God. Amen. God has called us and God has said to us, come now, let us reason together. Though your sin be as scarlet, he's willing to wash you as white as snow. So Moses says, Moses said in verse, verse number six, Moses says that when you have left Egypt and since you have left Egypt, walk in the ways of God. Walk in the ways of God. Walk in the ways of God. And then... Have a wholesome fear for God. Verse number seven, he says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. <laughs> the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Let me share with you. God is able to take the worst of things and turn it around for your good. Right. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse number 28, and we know and for we know that all things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and to them that are called according to his purpose. I said to you some months ago that God is not sleeping. And I said to you some months ago that the administration can do what the administration wants to do. But sooner or later, God is going to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. Now we're looking at the possible. We already knew that we had the worst administrator of all time. And now the world is looking at the possibility of that worst administrator being in peace for the second time. Oh, he's making history for all the wrong things. Hmm. But God yet has promises. God, I want to talk about God's promises. When, when you look at verse number seven, we move from, from doing what God said do until we see when we do what God says do, then God has God's promises for us. He says, he says to us, for the Lord your God is bringing you. The word bringing means he's taking you. The word bringing you is means that he's moving you from one point to the other. The word bringing means that God is about to do some things. And not only is he about to do some things, he's in the process of doing some things. And because God is in the process of doing some things, you just hold on just a little while longer. God is bringing you into a good land. Yes, he is. He's bringing you into a good land. He, he's bringing you out. He, he's moving upon our lives. I can stop right here because I want to tell you today that God promises and God is the God who keeps his promises. God promises that it ain't always going to be like this. That's not good English, but I think you got my point. God has promises. He has promises for all of us. And God has promised that it won't always be this way. Not good English, but, but let me just share with you this. God has promised that things are going to turn around. I, I told you some months ago that, that God is not sleeping. God is watching and, and God is keeping. And I said to you some months ago, the same God that's watching this administration misuse children, cage them up, and misuse African Americans and, and those who are Asian, misusing those who are Hispanic, Hispanic, just wait just a little while longer. Because the same God that's allowing him to run rampant now is going to be the same God that put him on display for the whole world to see. Yes. For the whole world. And the whole world is seeing it. The whole, the whole world has making, is making comments. The whole world, world is visualizing what's going on. God keeps his promise. My first point to you today is God's promises are present. He says that I'm bringing you, I'm bringing you into a good land. I'm bringing you into a good land. And then he goes on to describe this good land. He says, I'm bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water. It's, it's interesting to note here that he's bringing them to a land 
of brooks of water, mm -hmm. a land of fountains, a land of springs that flow out of the valley and out of the hills. He's bringing us. He, he is bringing them to brooks of water. See, it's interesting to note that simply because there was a time when the Israelites, after they had left out of Egypt land, they cried out against Moses, and Moses had to speak to a rock, and God gave them water out of the rock. But let me just share with you today, he promises that they're not only going to be a rock that gives away water. There's not only going to be a rock that you have to stand around and go to the rock one or two people at a time, but he says to them and his promises, there are going to be brooks of water where the whole million of people can walk around that brook, can get into the brook. There are going to be fountains of water. That means that there will be fountains that will flow out of the brook of water that flows from the hills and flows from the valleys. Look at, look at what he says. And not only will it flow from the hills. You see, gravity, gravity says that water naturally flows from the top to the bottom. The law of gravity says that water at the top will have to flow from the bottom. But look at what it says. Because he is the almighty God, not only will it flow from the hills, it will flow from the lowest point. It will flow from the hills and from the valley. It reminds me of that song, the blood <laughs> that gives us strength, <laughs> that flows. It flows to every mountain and it flows down to every valley. The God that we serve is able to make gravity behave. All right. It will flow. It will flow. It, and not only will it flow, it will flow in such a way that it flows from a fountain. This word fountain, this word fountain, I, I learned I learned through, through physics that fountain, at a fountain you need some pressure. You need a pump or you need an injection. You need something that will push that water through the fountain. Let me tell you, the God that we serve, he can put some force behind his water. Mm -hmm. He can move water from point A to point B, and he doesn't need gravity's help. Right. It will flow from mountains, and it will flow from springs. It will flow from springs. God has a way of not only making it flow in clunks, but he will make it flow in little bitty drops. <laughs> you see, God, the God that we serve is such an awesome God until he knows what your flowers need. Yes. He knows what your trees need. You see, we can water the flower, we can water the grass, but none of our water is like the water that comes from heaven. <laughs> you know, some folk back home, what they did in Mississippi, they set pots out. And so when it rained, they got rainwater because the water out of the fountain was never pure as the rainwater. They got rainwater and they watered their crops. They, they watered their flowers with rainwater. And what God does, because he is the great God, because he's the excellent God, because he's God all by himself, what God does, he knows that your plants, he knows that your crop cannot handle a big bucket of water all at one time. So he breaks it down into raindrops. Mm -hmm. Look at God. Look at what God does. He breaks it down into raindrops. He knows that you he, he can't just dump stuff down from heaven and your flowers sustain themselves. What he does, he makes it raindrops because he's the almighty God. So he brings it in springs. He, he, he brings it in. He, he says that there will be brooks of water. So there will be water just floating down through the brooks, floating down through the river. Then he says there will be fountains of water where a group of people can go to the fountain and drink from the fountain. But then he said there will be springs, meaning that he will shadow, he will shadow, shadow it down. He will shelve it down in sprinkles. And this flow from both the valley and the hills. Verse number eight says, not only will he bring water there, but he will bring a supply of raw resources. He, he promises. Look at what God promises us. I'm talking about God's promise. And he says that he's going to give you a new land. And then my second point is, is it's God's blessings that's taken over. Look at God's blessing is taken over. And we will find out later in Deuteronomy, God says that your blessings will run you down. God says your blessings will be in the field. Your God says your blessings will be in the house. The God says your blessings will make you the head and not the tail. 
He says a, a land, verse number eight, he says a land of wheat and barley, a land of vines and a land of fig trees, a land of pomegranates, a land of olive oil, a land of honey, and there will be no scarcity in this land. Man will lack nothing in this land. They will eat bread without scarcity in which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron out of whose hills you will dig copper. I'm going to say to you, first of all, God makes his promises. Secondly, God gives us his blessings. And God is blessing us, overwhelmingly blessing us. If you don't have an oxygen tank this morning, God has blessed you. If you have an oxygen tank this morning, God has blessed you. If you're not under the ground and the ground is not on top of you, God himself has blessed you. Yeah, we have God's promise. God promises to walk with us. God promises if we just keep his word. God promises if we just hold to his commandment. God promises that he will make these blessings run over us and run us down. So we have God's promise. We have God's blessings. Look at what God blesses us with. He, he not only blesses us with water. Verse number eight says he blesses us with wheat. He blesses us with barley. He, he blesses us with vines of, vines of fig trees. He, he blesses us with pomegranate. He blesses us with olive oil. He blesses us with honey. Let me just tell you something. I like a little bread with my honey. <laughs> In other words, when I sit down to eat, whether it is eating eggs, whether it's eating bread, I'm going to dash it on. I'm going to pour it on. And that's why I no longer have my six pack. I have a keg because I got a whole lot of honey in there. Let me just share with you today. Let me share, share with you today. God will bless us with the right amount of bread at the right time. He, he will bless us with the right amount of olive oil. He's saying to us that we will be prosperous. We will be a prosperous group of people. He, he said to the Israelites, God is going to make you prosperous. God is going to bless you. Just hold on. Just wait it out. Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not faint. They shall walk and not give out. They shall be blessed of the Lord. Hold on. Wait on the Lord. He says, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord. He says, in the midst, Isaiah says, in the midst of young men getting tired, in the midst of old men getting worn out, you shall mount up with wings as eagles if you just hold on and keep my commandments. Yes. He says, hold on. He says, hold on. <coughs> just wait. The, God's promises is available. God's blessings are available. And finally, in verse number 10, he says that, you will find copper. You will find iron. Verse number nine says copper and iron will be present. Well, what that has to do with it is the, the industry that will take place. Whenever a city or a state no longer have proper industry, depression sits in. Mm -hmm. Unemployment sits in. God says to the Israelites that I'm going to make your, in your, your industry prosperous. He says, I'm going to make, I'm going to make it where, where your industry will not go broke. I'm going to make it where your industry will not be bankrupt. God says, I'm going to have blessings overflowing. If you just hold on. Verse number 10 says, when you have eaten in our fool, when you have eaten and have gotten fulfilled. When you've eaten and you got enough. When you have eaten and your belly is full. When you have eaten, then shall you bless the Lord God for the good land which he has given you. I said to you, we see in this text God's promises. We see in this text God's blessings. And the final thing I see in this text, God's worship. Not that God is worshiping us, but I see where we have to worship God. 
You know, it, it just it just irks me to hear folk talk about, you know, Pastor, I can't get into all that. I that's just not me, and I don't understand what people have to holler and scream about. I don't know what they have to shout about. I don't know why they're raising their hands and, and praising the Lord. I don't know why they have to go through all that. But the same folk that won't raise their hand to the God who has blessed them, they raise their hand to the losing Texas. They, they raise their hand to Arizona. They raise their hand to Pittsburgh. They raised their hand, God forbid, if they didn't raise their hand to the Dallas Cowboy. They raised their hands. They shout for joy. They celebrate the Houston Rockets. They celebrate the Houston Dynamo. They celebrate the Sugar Land Skeeters, but they will not celebrate God. They won't glorify him. They won't praise him. But I come by to tell you, that J.J. Watts didn't send me a check the other day. I want to serve notice on you that my favorite quarterback, Deshaun Watson, haven't given me a dime yet. I'm still waiting. But for the last 57 and a half years, the God that I serve, he has watched over me. He has kept me in the midst of my trouble, in the midst of my hard time, in the midst of unemployment. God has kept me. The Bible says, the Bible says when you've gotten full, when you have gotten enough, when your belly is full, when you've gotten to the point where you've eaten all you can afford to eat, then you ought to praise the Lord. Let me tell you today, we still live in the great United States of America. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what people act like. We still live in the great United States of America. And because we live in the great United States of America, that's what God has done for us. And that's enough. That's that's enough. We have privileges that nobody else has. We're able to do things that no one else can do. And even when they try to shut it down, God steps right in on time. I'm telling you today, God's promises are available. God's blessings are present. And God's worship ought to be on our hearts. We ought to worship him. We ought to praise him. He says, when you're full, when you got enough, when you've been blessed of the Lord, you ought to bless the Lord. Yes. Too many of us are blessing our jobs. Mm. Too many of us are looking at our full weight, 401k. We're looking at our retirement plan. Too many of us are looking for social security. You ought to bless the Lord. And if you bless the Lord, the Lord will keep right on blessing you. Yeah. You ought to be blessing him right now in your house. You ought to be praising him right now in your house. He has given you water. He's given you agriculture. He's given you food. He's given you breath that you inhale and exhale. He has given you all you need. You see, for some of us, if they call for another shutdown, some of us got food to last for six whole months. We got it in our cupboard. We, we got it in our free refrigerator. We got it in our deep freezer. We got enough to last us for six whole months. And it's not because you were a smart shopper. It wasn't because of your money. It wasn't because of your education. It's because God has blessed you. And that's why you ought to raise your hand this morning. You ought to thank him for what he's already done. You ought to rejoice for God has blessed you one more again. Amen. That's why, that's why, that's why we ought not mind. We ought not mind. Let me just testify while I'm at it. We ought not mind giving God 10% or more of our gross income because all of it belongs to God. We ought to praise him with our income because when he gives us our income, he could have kept it. And he could not have given it to us. He didn't need it for himself. Therefore, he gave it to us. We ought to rejoice in giving. We ought to run to give it. We ought to praise him in the midst of our giving. Not only should we understand the blessings of God, not only should we realize the promises of God, we ought to be willing to worship God. We ought to be willing to lose ourselves. We, we ought to be willing to shut down our own little thing. We ought to be willing to, to say hallelujah to the Lamb. Stop faking it. Somebody asks you what you, how you doing, you can't even answer the simple question because you want to put on a show. 
You want to say, oh, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. It's not time. Just tell them how you're doing. But when God blesses you, when you've eaten and gotten full, you ought to praise him. I don't care if you're on your job. I don't care if you're in the grocery store. I don't care if you're in the street. You ought to honor God for what God has already done. Amen. He's blessing us. He's keeping us. Virus is running rapid, and I'm still able to raise my voice. <laughs> Virus have taken over over seven, over 370,000 people in America alone, and I'm still able to say thank you, Lord. While you got breath in your body, while you got activity of your limb, you ought to thank God for what God has already done. Yes, right. Yeah, you ought to thank him. You ought to thank him. And some of y'all got testimonies. <laughs> Some of y'all got something that God has brought you through. God has rebuked the vow for your sake. And you ought to honor him and glorify him. Anyhow, this ought to be a new year. It ought to be a new year of thanksgiving to God. It ought to be a new year of honoring him. It ought to be a new year of praising him. It ought to be a new year of ushering into worship. Whether you're in the church building or not, you cannot let your worship, you cannot let your praise be confined to a building. Yes. Because if we never get back in the building, God is still God. Yes. And he's still sitting on the throne and he's still blessing us. And that's why I say, God, thank you. Amen. God, I glorify you. God, I magnify you. God, I worship you. God, I thank you for who you are and what you have already done. When you're full, when you've gotten to a point, I started to just preach that one verse today. When you have gotten to a point where you have copper, when you've gotten to a point where food and water is not scarce, when you've gotten to a point where God has blessed you in your industry, you don't have any choice but praise the Lord. Yes. He says, when you've gotten full, then you shall bless the Lord, your God. And you ought to bless him for the land in which you live. You ought to praise him for what he's already done. Yes. And not only should you praise him for what he has done, you ought to praise him for what he's doing right now. You ought to thank him, bless his name for what he's doing right now. Let me tell you, God is doing some things right now yes. that men could never predict on their own. But I read the book. <laughs> I read the book. And not only did I read the book, I read the cliff notes. <laughs> well, when I was when I when I was in Mississippi and I, I began to read just a little bit more, I wanted to look at books. I, I remember the very first book I read was JFK. It was it was John Fristell Kennedy. It, it was his biography of his death. And I read and I recited even today, word for word, because I read the whole book. But then when I had an assignment in junior high school, I went to Seymour Library in Indianola, Mississippi. And I ran into a librarian. And the librarian said to me, well, if we can't find the book, we can get the cliff notes. <laughs> She said, she said to me, if we can't find the book, you see, this was before internet. If we cannot find the book, right. let's walk over here where we store the cliff notes. You see, cliff notes was a summary of the book. If the book was one inch thick, the cliff note was like a millimeter in height. And I could go through the cliff note, and in the cliff note, the author summed up the entire book. And then the author went from chapter to chapter and summed up, summed up every chapter. Now, I was wise enough to know that I couldn't write down everything that was in the cliff note, but what I did do, I read the cliff note, and in the cliff note, I put it in my own word, and I turned in my paper because I have read the cliff note. What I'm trying to tell you is that not only have I read the book, I've turned to the back of the book, in the book of Revelation, and I've read the cliff note. In the book of Revelation, what I know as the cliff note says we win. It says that God's promises are real. Yes. And because we win, I bless the Lord. <laughs> I throw up my hands. I do my dance. I jump to my feet because I've read what God has said. And God says, we win. There's somebody here today 
who don't know or who didn't know that they win or don't know if you win, let me just share with you today. God says you can be a winner. You just need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The door of the church is open. The door is open. The door is open. You can come to Jesus. Just as you are. I know you're saying, but preacher, I messed up. Let me just tell you, I messed up too. I, I was messed up. And every now and then I mess up. But God is faithful. And God is just. To forgive us of all our sins. And if you want to take life flight, when Jesus come back, you got to be born again. You must be. You have to be. You got to be born again. Now being born again, it's not running, jumping, shouting, rolling on the floor. Being born again is not speaking in other tongues. These things you may choose to do, that's left up to you and the Holy Spirit. But what you must do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. You can receive Jesus right now. Regardless of what you've been through. Regardless of what has been done to you. You can receive Jesus right now. Yes. Just believe the story. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a skull hill called Calvary. He died, I tell you. Mean men killed him. Mean men buried him in a barred tomb. But early that third day morning, God raised his only son. Jesus Christ from the dead. He got up for you and he got up for me. If you want to go to heaven, this is your moment to set up reservations. Just repeat after me in a simple prayer and invite Jesus Christ into your life. The prayer is something like, Jesus, I believe that, that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead. And I come into my life and make me a new person. Will you join me in prayer and just repeat after me? Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed this prayer and honestly invited Christ into your life, we believe that you're born again. We believe that you're saved. We believe that you're on your way to heaven. And there may be, may be others of you who, who have not, who have received Jesus Christ, but who have not been consistent in church, consistently walking as, as Moses talked about, walking in obedience to the commandments of God. I want to pray for you right now. And, and I ask you to recommit, rededicate, resolute in your heart that you're going to follow Jesus. Father God, we come praying for those who have a need to recommit to you. I pray that you bless them and keep them. Auction them. When the devil tries to continue to lead them the wrong way, I ask you to step in and make a way out of nowhere. Bless them as they receive you now for rededication. Strengthen them in your word and your will and your way. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God.
And there may be others of you who are in between church homes or do not have a church home. I say to you today, we'll be glad for you to join the New Beginning Church. You can join online. People all over the nation have joined online and you can do the same. We would like for you to be a part of the New Beginning Church. For those of you who have received Jesus Christ, inbox me and let me know so we can rejoice together. For those of you who have rededicated your life, inbox me and let me know so we can rejoice together. For those of you who want to join, be a part of the New Beginning Church, where Jesus is the center of attention, he's the main attraction. Inbox me and let me know if we can get you a membership form and uh, you can be a part of this great church in the Southeast Houston area. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give to the Lord. It's an opportunity to give to the Lord, for the Lord has blessed us, and we want to bless the Lord. We want to bless the Lord for what he is, for who he is, and what he has done. You can give so by one of three means. First of all, you can give by way of Cash App. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. Dollar sign NBC Souls. Dollar sign NBC Souls. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea is as you lift Jesus, as we lift Jesus, he would draw all men unto himself. Or you can mail in your tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts, and we we encourage you to do either of these three. You can mail in to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77. Four five nine, P.O. Box five zero three, Missouri City, Texas seven seven four five nine. Thank you for joining us for this service. We're here every Sunday at ten forty five. Thank you so much for joining us today, and you can join us on Sunday morning for Sunday school at nine a.m. every Sunday, and you can join us on Wednesday nights at 7.20 p.m. for Bible study. Again, thank you so much for being a part of our service and, and joining us in our service today. We are listening to the Bible. We are listening by way of our electronic devices. We are listening to the Bible. Today, today's listening is um, Genesis 30, 31 through 35. Genesis 31 through 35. We're in Genesis 31 through 35. We're asking every member, every visitor to listen to the Bible this year. I didn't say read it. We do want you to read it and study it, but we want to do as a corporate group, we want you to listen to the Bible. And if you don't have the listen to the Bible schedule, inbox me and let me know and I'll be glad to send it to you. Uh, listening to the Bible. Those who are not members of our church have requested the Bible listening schedule. Uh, uh, it's on our Facebook page, on, on the church Facebook page, as well as my Facebook page. We're listening to the Bible, and as we listen, we are journaling, writing down what God is saying to us. So please join us and be a part. There's nothing more powerful than the Word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the Word of God will always stand. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We'll continually pray for you you can continue to pray for us. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening the families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John chapter 12, verse 32. Let us go to God in prayer. 
Father, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for your promises. And we thank you for the worship that we ought to give unto you. Now, Lord, we ask you to continue to bless us, to bless the Lord. Give us strength, give us state of mind to bless the Lord. Bless us, Father God, for we know that we have hope in you. We ask you to bless us, to bless you. And Lord, we thank you for all your many blessings, for keeping us, keeping our health, keeping our strength, keeping our clothing, keeping our households, keeping our industry. Now, Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise. Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Thank God. God bless you. God keep you is our prayer. Go in peace.